Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 through 15. Would you follow along with me as I read from the, from the first book of the Bible? They heard, Adam and Eve, heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was, I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. God said to him, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit from the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent tricked me and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you among all animals and among all wild creatures. Upon your belly you shall go, and and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the world. Amen. Thanks be to God. So there's this uh, TV show that's been on the Discovery Channel for 17 seasons now. It's a long run for any show. 11 years, 17 seasons. And there's been a few different iterations of the show, but I guess it's popular enough because it's been on for a very long time. Now, I remember back in the day when the Discovery Channel was about, like, education and learning, and they had a show called, like, How Things are made or something like that. I love that show. It was really kind of boring, but I loved it. But now they've got all this other stuff that's all in, you know, this high action stuff. And the premise of this show that I'm describing, believe it or not, can be found in Genesis 3. I, I'm not sure. I, I don't know that I would say that the creators of the show uh, were intentionally building a show upon what we read in Genesis 3, but the story in the Hebrew Scriptures, but the show depicts something similar to what I just read in Genesis 3. Uh, Maybe you know where this is going, but I doubt it. The show is called Naked and Afraid. Now, I I won't say that I've never seen any bit of the show before, but I will say that it's an interesting one. It's not really my cup of tea. I like survival shows like Man vs. Wild with Bear Grylls. I could watch Bear Grylls all day. Um, But you know, naked afraid, just not for me. But the premise of the show is this. Two strangers, a man and a woman, who are supposedly survival experts, they go out into the wild and they have to try to survive for a certain point of time to get from point A to point B together out in the wilderness with nothing uh, but just a little bag. And of course, they have to be naked. I mean, surviving in the wild with a stranger seems challenging enough to me, fully clothed, but I don't know. Um, I couldn't tell you why the show has been on longer than I've been the, the, the pastor here, but part of me wonders if there isn't some allure to it in that there is some parallel with the story of Adam and Eve. After all, what did Adam say when God asked him, when God said, where are you? What did Adam say? Adam replied, I was afraid because I was naked, that maybe there is this kind of primal creation, uh, just kind of imagination that this show has had these 17 seasons. Adam and Eve were maybe the first contestants on Naked and Afraid. I was afraid because I was naked. But I think there are more parallels with this show than just being scared and unclothed, because in the show Naked and Afraid, they're supposed to survive the wilderness. The wilderness is something to be conquered. The wilderness is their adversary. The thing they are trying to overcome is not just surviving together with somebody you don't know, but is also how can we conquer our adversary, which is the wilderness. It might be beautiful, but the wilderness is the thing that they have to conquer in order to survive. There is enmity between humanity and creation in the wilderness. The wilderness is dangerous. It is out to get them, and it poses many threats. Genesis 3 tells us the origin story of that enmity between humanity and creation. Because prior to Genesis 3, the introduction of sin in the world, the relationship between humanity and creation was not one of adversary. It was one of harmony and beauty. 
There was no exploitation of creation by humans, nor were there threats to humanity by the creatures. But what I just read tells the story of how our first parents introduced this enmity. Because you have done this, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. Here is the introduction between the the adversarial nature between humanity and creation that has not yet been fully restored. Genesis 3 tells us the story of how humanity transgressed against God, but how did we get here? Because in in the first two chapters of the Bible, Genesis 1 and 2, we, we read about the goodness and the beauty of God's creation. And what we read in those chapters, it's not hostility, it's harmony. At initial creation, we read that God created humanity and the world to be for the world. Let me say that again. God created humanity in the world to be for the world. Maybe you see where I'm going with this. Genesis 1 says about humanity, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. The first account of creation in Genesis 1 talks about how humanity was to have dominion over creation. This is kind of this royal kingly office that we are to have be rulers of creation. But the second account of creation, Genesis chapter 2, shows us what this dominion looks like and it reveals what the what our what our authority is supposed to look like. We read in Genesis 2, the Lord God took took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to till it and keep it. That's a little bit different than just having power over it. It's caring for it. In the creation stories, we see that God created humanity to have this royal position among the created created order, to have power and authority directly from God over the earth. Humanity had not just power, but also, as we saw in Genesis 2, responsibility. Dominion wasn't about ruling creation. It was about taking care of it. We were to love the earth, to tend it, to to care for the flora and the fauna. We were God's representatives on the earth. And in that, we were to be a benefactor for creation. Our role in creation, in the creation stories, was to work towards the fulfillment of all creation. To till and to keep the garden was to love it and cultivate it so that it might become what it was capable of becoming. What's remarkable is that God did not create everything in a finished state. God created things in a in a first state, put humanity into that world and said, you have work to do. Your job is to care for this thing to participate with God in the fulfillment of all things. From the very beginning, we were created in and for. Humanity had a calling from the very start to be in the world and for the world. And God created created us to love the earth, to take care of it, to give himself up for creation. Genesis 2, tend and keep it. Another way of saying it is that in the beginning, God created us to be, as 1 Peter 2 would later say, a royal priesthood. Because what is the role of a priest? The role of the priest is to be a mediator between God and creation. To speak God's truth to others, but then also to offer others' lives to God. The role of the priest is to live in the liminal in-between space between divinity and the created order. And in creation, we see that God placed humanity in that space that said, you are my representatives on the earth. Care for it, tend it, fulfill it for my purposes. So, what went wrong? What happened that made things turn sideways? Well, that's where Genesis 3 comes in. God created us to tend the earth in an offering back to God and to represent God to all of creation. That's a priestly role, a royal priestly role. So what went wrong with this first sin was more than just disobedience. 
It was disobedience, but it was more than just disobedience like not listening to your mom or dad when they tell you that you can't have candy, which is maybe what we think that this was. The problem of this first sin was a dereliction of God-given responsibilities. It was a failure to fulfill the call that God had placed upon those first humans. They were to tend the earth, to care for it, to help creation flourish into the good and beautiful thing that God had intended it to be. For God's sake and for the sake of the world. In the world. For the world. But when our first parents ate of that tree, they were desiring to usurp their divinely given work of offering creation to God and representing God to creation and using God's creation, listen, church, for their own benefit. They ceased their priestly work of offering God to creation and offering creation back to God, they ceased to be royal priests who were consecrating creation to God, and instead they were using creation for their own selfish gain, for their own vanity, for their own selfish pursuits. You will be like God when you eat of the tree. Now I want to go a little bit east Orthodox theologian, an Eastern Orthodox theologian, Alexander Shmeman, which is just a great name. I mean, Shmeman sounds like something you put on your bagels. I don't know. Eastern Orthodox theologian Alexander Shmeman wrote about this first sin, and what he wrote about it was so fascinating. He wrote in the 1960s about this, and he called it simply consumerism. When Adam and Eve ate the the fruit of the tree of knowledge, he wrote, they were consumers, utilizing something good and beautiful in its own right for their own selfish purposes. Now, I'm not going to quote him at length this morning, but I do want you to listen to what he says about the sin of our first parents. This is Orthodox theologian. Perhaps no word better expresses the essence of the new fallen non-priestly way of life than the one which in our time has had an amazingly successful career, has truly become the very symbol of our modern culture. It is the word consumer. He continues, the first consumer was Adam, Adam himself. He chose not to be a priest, but to approach the world as a consumer, to eat of it and to use and to dominate it for himself, to benefit from it, but not to offer, not to sacrifice, not to have it for God and in God. Because here's the thing, church, the tree of knowledge of good and evil was not a bad thing. When the Lord God told our first parents not to eat of it, it wasn't because it was a bad thing. I mean, God created all things and said they were good. That includes the tree of knowledge of good and evil. God didn't put that tree there simply to provide a test for them to inevitably fail. I sometimes think that's what we think about that tree, that, well, why would God put that tree in the garden and tell them not to eat of it? Is God just testing them? God put that tree there because it was good. It just wasn't meant for their own personal exploitation. Knowledge was not there for them to simply consume, but was there for them to offer to God and to offer in God to the world. Now, I'm not going to quote him any further, but Shmeman goes on to talk about how consumerism has infiltrated the church. Now, listen, this was 60 years ago. That the way we perceive the church and our worship today is maybe not unlike that of Adam and Eve eating of that tree. Because the church, like the tree of knowledge, is a good and beautiful organism. She is, after all, the bride of Christ. That is not to say that she is without her issues because of the way in which we lead and serve and operate as a church, but she is the bride of Christ, and she is a good and beautiful thing. But how often do we talk about the church and treat her like Adam and Eve did that tree? 
How often is our worship something that we think we need to consume, to eat of? I mean, what's the number one, number one reason people leave a church and find another church in, in, the, in our day and age? I hear it all the time. I'm not being fed. What does that sound like? I'm not being fed. That's consumerism. We want the church to be a utility that makes our lives better, easier, less stressful, with less anxiety, more connected, helps us get elected to office, etc., etc. Let me add, church, that nine times out of ten, if people aren't being fed in a church, it's likely because, hear me now, it's likely because they're not doing their job of tending the soil of that church. Because, church, listen, you get out of church what you put into it. In our consumeristic culture, is the church here to make sure people are fed? Or... Is the church here because she serves a royal and priestly role in the world? Could it be that the purpose of the church is not simply to fill your spiritual stomach, but to represent God to the world and the world to God? Friends, the church exists not to be exploited by consumers but to offer God to the world and the world to God. Now listen, what if when you came to worship, your job wasn't to be fed, even though we do feasts at the table of the Lord, but to be Christ for someone else? To represent to others here in this place and in this time the love and compassion of Jesus Christ. You have a priestly role in the church, friends. What if when you came to worship, your job wasn't just to stuff your face with good teaching, even though I pray that the teaching here is filling to your spirits, but to help others see Christ is already at work in their lives? You have a priestly role in the church. What if instead of consuming the church, we were instead consecrators of our lives to God and others in the church? Because listen, church, the antidote to consumerism isn't simply eating more and more and more. We aren't saved from a consumer church by leaving one congregation and trying to find another one where we can stuff our faces again. Now listen, there are really good and important reasons to find a new congregation. I'm not dismissing that. What I'm saying is... If we're simply going to jump from being a consumer of one congregation to another congregation to another congregation, we are not remedying anything. We're just going to a different buffet. We don't, we are not freed from consumerism like that. No, the remedy, church, listen, the remedy for this consumption is consecration. Do you know what that means? The antidote to sin is sacrifice, surrender, surrendering yourself for the sake of God's will and for the sake of others. You see, in Adam, we see the story of brokenness, fallenness in the world. But then when we look to Jesus, we have what Paul will call a second Adam. This is what Paul calls him in his New Testament epistles, Jesus, the sacrificial consecrating second Adam, is the, re is the remedy, the redeemer for the sinful consumer first Adam. Paul says, as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. This is why I read from Luke chapter 22 earlier in this service. Jesus, the night in which he was betrayed, the night when his trial began, right before his life would be sacrificially offered, he went out into the wilderness to pray. Actually, do you know where he went? Do you know what it says? He went to a garden. Jesus was paralleling Adam. 
Adam in the garden consumed of that tree and brought sin into the world. Jesus, the night before he was hung up on a tree, went out into a garden not to consume but to consecrate. On the night and when he was betrayed, he went out to pray. And Jesus did, let me, let me tell you, church, he did not want to be crucified. He wasn't looking towards that cross saying, yes, take me there. What was his prayer to his father the night before he died? Lord, if it is possible, if there is any way, would you take this cup from me? Let this cup pass from me. I don't want to do this thing. Yet, that's an important word in the text here, church. Yet, he says, not my will, but yours. Not my will, but yours. You see how this is the antithesis of the first Adam? Adam chose his own desires. He preferred his own will. I can be like God. Jesus chose not his own preferences or his own will, but even though he was God, gave up that status for his Father's will. You know what that is, church? That's surrender. That is consecration, a giving up of yourself for the sake of God and for the sake of the world. It's sacrifice. In church, surrender is the only remedy for sin. Consecration is the only redemption for consumeristic style exploitation to use something for my own sake, to make my life easier or faster or better. To be truly in the world and for the world, as Christ was in the world and for the world, means that we are a consecrated people like Jesus was. Now, friends, listen, if you're struggling with sin, I'm telling you that the remedy for it isn't pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. The remedy for it isn't working harder and harder and trying to fix everything and and relying on your own strength. Church, the remedy for sin, the redemption of sin is surrender. Not my will, but yours. God is calling each and every one of us to be fully surrendered. Completely consecrated. And when I say fully surrendered, I mean fully surrendered, where no part of our lives are withheld from the Lord. Our hearts are our thoughts, our feelings, our bodies, our relationships, our children, our dreams, our aspirations, our fears, our anxieties, our joys, our sorrows, our losses, our celebrations, everything, church, all of it. It can all be surrendered, consecrated, given over to the Lord. And do you know what the Lord does when things are consecrated to Him? He sanctifies them. He makes them whole. When Christ gave himself up and consecrated himself on the cross, what did God do but resurrect him to new life? Here's the thing, church. Until things are consecrated, God doesn't sanctify them. Because God is not a God who takes away from us, but will use the things we freely offer to him. So let me ask you, church, is there any part of life that you're holding on to? Are there parts of your spirit, your relationships, your heart, your thoughts, your practices, your habits that you have not yet surrendered to the Lord? Let me ask you why we're holding on to these things so tightly. Are we consumers of these things? Are we holding on to these so tightly, hoping that we can use them for our benefit, for our own gain, for our own selfish purposes? Because to let go of it would be pretty scary. Church, that is the sin of Adam, to try to exploit these things for our own gain. But the hope of Christ, which we have already seen, is realized through surrender. Not my will. 
not my will, but yours. Now, church, God has called us to be in the world and for the world. That's not unique to us. This is what it means to be faithful followers of Jesus, fulfilling our royal priestly role. But the truth is, unless we are consecrated, unless we give ourselves over to the Lord fully, individually, but also corporately, then our work is going to be stifled, stunted, incomplete. So today, like every Sunday, church, there is going to be offered an altar call. Did you know that that's what happens every single Sunday when we come to the table? Every Sunday that we come to the table, that is an altar call. In the truest sense of the word, you are being called to the altar to take, to eat, and to drink. But today, I want, to, I want to do something a little bit more. I want to extend an invitation to respond to the word of the Lord and to open it up a little bit. As you are invited to the table and as you come to the table this morning, perhaps you know and perhaps the Lord has speaking to you about parts of your own life that have not been surrendered, that have not been consecrated, that we are holding on to really tightly, that we're just a little afraid to let go of because if we let go of this thing, we will be exposed, we will be seen as naked in front of the Lord and we're holding on to it so tightly, we're not offering it up to the Lord. Are you holding on to any part of your life that you're afraid to lay bare before him? Well, then maybe, maybe we need to come to this altar, and, as, and before we come and take of the ele- elements, maybe we need to offer ourselves up to the Lord today in consecration. Because we can only be in the world and for the world as much as we have consecrated our own lives to the Lord. And we will not fulfill his purposes if we are clinging to things that we are unwilling to let go of. So church, come to the table today. You are all invited to come to the table and to receive the priestly love of Christ in his broken body and shed blood, where God is made real to us and we are, where we are presented to God. But also, church, come to the altar today and if the Spirit has been speaking to you, then offer yourself up to, up to Him in prayer so that God can use your life for His holy purposes. These altars are always open for you to pray, but maybe there's a special consecration in your life that you need to offer to Him today and say, Lord, not my will, but yours be done with this. I know I'm holding on to this and I'm afraid to let go of it, but I surrender it to you today. Take it and use it for your purposes. So as you come to the table, please know that you can come and and offer a surrendering prayer to the Lord and he can fulfill and make whole our lives in ways we could have never imagined. So church, come to the table today, but please know, that in Christ there is full redemption and it is offered to us freely as we surrender our lives to him. And church, this is the good news of Jesus Christ for us today.